And good morning, everyone. We are back for another episode of our Powered by Drug Bank academic webinar series. My name is Chris. I'm the scientific support lead for bioinformatics at Drug Bank, and I'll be the host of today's webinar. Every year, there is an increasing volume of scientific literature um, that can have huge potential to deliver improved patient outcomes. Drug Bank works hard to ensure that this information can be structured and easily available for researchers to power the amazing work that they do. And the purpose of this series is to give those researchers a chance to share the hard work and the amazing insights that they produce. Today, we are sitting down with Dr. Hamoud, and she'll be discussing uh, some information about graph theory, uh, modeling, and visualizing biomedical networks. So very, very quickly, I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Hamoud to do a quick introduction. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. So my name is Zainab Hamoud. I uh, work as a junior uh, research group uh, leader in Germany at the uh, University of Augsburg. I did my PhD in medical bioinformatics and my research focuses on data integration, reproducibility and interoperability. Perfect. Thank you for that. Okay, so we'll jump into the presentation right away here, uh, but I just wanted to quickly note that we will have a live Q&A following it. So feel free to pop all of your questions into the chat bar and we will save them for afterwards. So let's jump right in. Welcome everyone to today's lecture called From Graph Theory Towards Modeling and Visualizing Biomedical Networks. The lecture is structured as follows. I will start with an introduction of the topic, followed by presenting the junior research group called Multipath and two tools that uh, were implemented within this project called Molly and Multipath. And at the end, I will be presenting a collaboration project as a use case that I called Chili Project. Starting with the introduction, I would like to underline the differences between uh, these disciplines. If we consider three circles to be uh, three independent disciplines called biological sciences and applications, medical and clinical science and practice, and informatics, which encompasses information technology and information science, these disciplines are in practice not used independently. So uh, when we uh, use informatics using biological sciences or biological data, uh, this is called bioinformatics. Uh, informatics together with medical and clinical science is called uh, medical or uh, health informatics. Biological sciences and medicine is called translational biomedicine. And finally, all of these uh, three different uh, disciplines together are called biomedical informatics or medical bioinformatics. One field is also called bioinformatics, which is uh, a tra traditionally science of storing and analyzing biomolecular uh, sequence data, but the term is now used uh, much more broadly and it encompasses computational structural biology, chemical biology, and systems biology. And uh, uh, with uh, system biology, I mean both in terms of data integration and the modeling of systems. On the picture, you can also see uh, some uh, databases uh, and knowledge databases listed uh, under each category, which contain different kinds of data that is uh, used uh, within the scope of uh, this field. One specific type of data is called omics which is a suffix that no, is normally assigned to a technique used to study, identify, and measure a set of biological molecules such as proteomics for proteomes and genomics for genomes. It's a useful concept in biology which informally annotates a field of study ending in omics, and it aims at the collective characterization and quantification of pools of biological molecules that translate into the structure, dynamics, and function of an or organism. Now, uh, the term itself comes uh, originally uh, from a uh, uh, genome uh, that was created in 1920 by the botanist H. Winkler as a mix of the words gene and chromosome uh, to annotate the chromosome set as the material foundations of an organism. 
Now, based on that, we uh, consider different molecules, and the study of each molecule would give you a different uh, field. So, studying a gene uh, means uh, genomics, mRNA is transcriptomics, proteins is proteomics, and finally, metabolites is metabolomics. Then another type of data is called biological pathways, uh, which are series of actions among uh, molecules in a cell that lead to a certain product or a change in a cell. And they have many, uh, so healthy cells in a body have many processes that must all work together. And normally, uh, each alteration in a specific part of a pathway can result in diseases such as cancer, asthma, or diabetes. So medicines try to correct these faulty pathways and target these uh, alterations by switching a signaling pathway on and off. And such kind of information is often presented in scientific literature as text and diagrams. How does this uh, uh, biological uh, pathway, uh, uh, is, how is this data uh, curated? Now, how is this data curated? First, we have the experts that describe the pathways in their area and provide references. Then we have the curators, which work together with the authors to convert the information into a format that suits the database. And finally, when uh, both the curators and the author uh, agree on uh, the module uh, that it's uh, ready. It's sent for peer review by uh, experts or reviewers uh, in the field, then uh, published. Biological pathways are mainly classified into three categories. Uh, the first one is called signaling pathways, which uh, describe the transfer of a signal from the cell's exterior to its interior. Then we have metabolic pathways, which control chemical reactions, and gene regulatory pathways, which control genes activations or inhibition. Another uh, field that is interdisciplinary and critical uh, when using uh, these uh, uh, types of data is called network biology. So systems biology itself aims to understand biological entities at the systematic level as individual or as interacting systems. And when combining systems uh, biology with graph theory, it's then called network biology uh, that allows the representation and analysis of biological systems using tools derived from graph theory. In uh, network biology, uh, the uh, biological knowledge is, you, is uh, modeled using uh, networks. So you can see here on the right side of uh, the screen, uh, we have uh, two types of nodes. We have circles that represent the proteins and squares that represent the metabolites. Then we have different kinds of interactions. We have different colors and different shapes for uh, each type of interaction. What are uh, the biological network, uh, networks that are being modeled here? We have protein-protein interaction networks, metabolic networks, genetic interaction networks, gene transcriptional uh, regulatory networks, or uh, cell signaling network. This is when we get when we work with systems biology. Of course, there's also uh, the possibility of combining graph theory with uh, medicine, and this is called network medicine. It's an emerging area of research dealing with molecular and genetic interactions, network biomarkers of uh, disease, and therapeutic target discovery. Uh, in uh, such field, uh, different uh, biomedical data types uh, are used along with uh, network representations to uh, simplify different components of multiple omics data and, of course, combining biomedicine uh, data with uh, suitable uh, corresponding network representation would, uh, uh, would result in very significant outcomes, uh, for example, biomarkers, therapeutics, diagnostics, etc. Finally, I would also like to mention drug repurposing, which is the main uh, focus of today's lecture. Drug repurposing has many names. It's also called drug repositioning, drug rediscovery, or also drug reprofiling. It's a strategy to identify advanced uses of uh, uh, pre-approved drugs or existing medications. As, as to simplify the definition, we try to explore new medical uses for existing drugs, whether uh, approved, discontinued, uh, shelved, or uh, investigational therapeutics and uh, discover new uses 
سوا اكتيفيتي فور ا ديستنكت مالدي ان ان اولدر كلينيكلي يوزد دراج اور وان ذات فيلد ان ليتر ستيجز اوف ديفلوبمنت اتس بارشلي بريدكتد اند كاريد اوت يوزنج سيستماتيك ميثودز اند ان استيميشن بابليشد لاست يير شوود ذات وان ثيرد اوف ريسنت ابروفلز كوريسبوند تو ريبربسينج اكزامبلز Uh, this uh, uh, technique has many advantages compared to uh, de novo drug discovery or also called uh, orphan drug discovery uh, in terms of cost and time. Uh, both of uh, these techniques uh, uh, take time and have many steps to be, uh, to be followed. If we look at orphan drug discovery, we can see that uh, it has an average of 10 to 15 year uh, process time. It has less than 10% uh, success rate and it costs about $2.5 billion for each drug. Now, on the other hand, drug repurposing takes an average of 3 to 12 years of processing time, has a reduced risk because the success rate is between 30 to 75 percent, and it costs uh, 300 million dollars, which is much less than orphan drug discovery costs. Here I also have some examples of uh, drugs that were repurposed in the past. You can also see that uh, many of this uh, of these drugs and uh, diseases are uh, are very complex, and uh, the drug discovery uh, uh, in this case was uh, uh, not so easy. So the drug repurposing showed very fruitful outcomes. Now, based on this introduction, I would like to talk about a project that I worked on for uh, five years. This is called the Junior uh, Research Group Multipath. The motivation behind Multipath was the huge amount of molecular pathways that is stored separately in individual databases and in different formats. Here on the slide, you can see uh, some uh, examples of uh, knowledge databases and uh, uh, databases that contain such information. The main problem here is that biological data are uh, governed more by how the data is obtained rather than by what uh, the data means. And uh, there's a huge lack of standardization between the data resources. Another problem or challenge faced uh, when uh, working with pathway knowledge is that uh, uh, there is uh, other knowledge to be considered that is tightly connected and influencing this information, such as drugs and diseases. And I also have some uh, databases examples here on the slide for uh, drug data. So we faced uh, three challenges that we uh, aim to address. The first one is the data integration of uh, the multiple types of pathways. Uh, the second one is the lack of interoperability between the databases and the lack of analysis and visualization tools. And finally, and most importantly, the irreproducibility of illustrations of pathways shown in publications and used in analysis. So the information is spread across many several hundreds of papers. The scientific exploration is often uh, also an ongoing uh, work and information may be incomplete or outdated. It's uh, not easy to simultaneously investigate different types of biological information and pathways and finally it's uh, not accessible for computational reuse here on the right side of the screen you can see uh, one example of an illustration that was published in a certain paper of the signaling pathway p53 you can see certain shapes and certain colors but of course you don't have a legend or any annotations on uh, how this illustration was created which part of the pathway it was which version etc So the aim was to define a multi-layer framework for pathways and further knowledge by creating this genetic model, which is an n-layer model. Each layer in this model targets uh, specific entities of the pathways, and this would help us structure and condense knowledge in specific areas of interest. So if we are talking about pathways, we can uh, separate the entities of the pathways based on their types, and this would be the specific model. So we have one layer for DNA, another for protein, and a third for metabolites. Why did we go for multilayer graphs? Because of an effect called the hairball effect, which is uh, caused by the high number of nodes that are highly connected in a certain graph. So when you try to visualize such graphs, you have a high overlap between uh, the lines or the edges that represent 
uh, the relations between the nodes which would give you this uh, view of a hairball of a hairball and uh, what you can do here you can just uh, separate this over many layers and uh, this would give you a better overview of each uh, connection and each node for me, the first step was to uh, research this uh, type of uh, networks because it's not something that is very uh, used. Uh, I wanted to understand the difference uh, between mono and multi-layered graphs and uh, how uh, uh, each one works and which one is uh, used uh, for which purpose. So uh, monolayered graphs normally contain two sets. The first one is V, which is the set of vertices, and the second one is E, which is the set of edges. In a multi-layered graph, uh, we have an extra set that is called C, which is the set of colors or uh, the layers. And I was able to find that uh, multi-layered graphs are uh, categorized into two main uh, uh, groups. The first one is called node-colored, in which we, uh, we have heterogeneous nodes, and the edge-colored, in which we have heterogeneous edges. On the right side of the screen, you can see how you can go from a monolayer graph to a multilayer graph in both versions. So, if you have a node colored graph, you have different colors for the nodes. Uh, to uh, transform this into a multilayered graph, uh, we simply assign uh, each node a certain color and we embed this to the corresponding layer, and the edges are just uh, replicated from the original graph. For an edge colored graph, we have uh, different types for the edges, uh, which are uh, designed uh, using or represented using the colors. Now each uh, layer would contain the full set of nodes and only the edges are sub uh, subset and embedded within uh, the certain uh, uh, layer that corresponds to uh, the color that was given to uh, the edge in the original graph. Of course, in practice, this is used in a more complex uh, environment and there are many implementations of this. You can also look for uh, more information on uh, that if you are more interested. Uh, if you go uh, to uh, our paper that is listed on uh, the bottom of the screen to understand more about the different implementations of multilayer graphs. Last, I also researched about the uh, different applications of multilayer graphs in biomedicine, and I was able to find uh, many usages, for example, in uh, epidemiology, they're used to, for modeling SIR and SIS models, so susceptible, infected, and removed, uh, and in brain networks, they're also used, for example, for ECG to understand the different frequency bands, etc. I uh, listed some uh, papers and some works that were, that were uh, published uh, within uh, the field and you can also uh, look for uh, other examples if you refer to the paper that is listed on the screen. The workflow was as followed. We start with the input. The plan was to uh, refer to the databases for the encoded knowledge, then to use uh, parsers to integrate this data and implement a software to uh, create the pathway model and uh, uh, to be able to perform the operations. And at the end, uh, we uh, generate the output, which are the different views uh, created by uh, uh, the package that we implement after applying the operations. For this, I implemented uh, the package called Mali, which is an R package to create, modify, and visualize a multi-layered graph. It inherits uh, the R package iGraph, uh, and uh, it adds information on the layers, and it provides standard operations as well as uh, many features. So uh, we create the N uh, layer uh, model, and we uh, are able to generate the different views. The package is available on GitHub under the following link and also on uh, CRAN. So, uh, in uh, Mali, we can generate and layer models which are node colored and layer disjoint, which means each node can belong to a maximum of one layer, and the layers are created by the users. I implemented the standard uh, procedures which are add, uh, adding and removing uh, nodes, edges, or uh, whole layers. Transitivity, which is a very critical uh, feature when working with pathways because it's crucial not to break the chain. So when removing a certain node, transitive edges are added. 
Track and undo, which allows the user to uh, uh, store the modifications applied to a certain uh, graph to be able to undo any alteration. Visualization, for which I implemented two visualizers, the regular 2D visualizer or the uh, plot, and uh, the 3D visualizer, which is based on uh, RGL, so it's interactive and the user can rotate uh, the graph and see it from different angles and finally the layer based merging which means uh, merging uh, two different uh, graphs, uh, graphs based on the uh, layers that they have. I implemented this separately because I uh, wanted to address uh, a bigger audience uh, because I didn't want to limit the usage of Mali to only biomedical usage and uh, then I implemented the uh, other package called Multipath uh, R package in which I performed the data integration of pathway relevant data from multiple sources. I use the package Mali to generate the multi layer models and the package is available on GitHub. So how does Multipath work? Uh, we have three main data sources. The first one is uh, Pathways, which uh, is uh, uh, from Reactum and is uh, encoded uh, in Biopacks. For this, I used uh, the package called uh, RBiopacks parser to parse the data. Second, I have, of course, drug bank uh, entries. So I have drug information from drug bank for which I used an R package called DB parser to parse the data and be able to uh, integrate it with uh, pathway data. And finally, I also included information on proteins uh, using uh, Uniprot.ws, which allows us to query the database of uh, Uniprot. After uh, fetching the information from three databases, I integrate them uh, and then I create the uh, model using MULI and at the end the outcome would be the knowledge model. To understand more how uh, multipath work, I have uh, an example on uh, on a workflow so first of all you download the pathway this is the code for the reaction pathway for uh, signaling by wind you can here choose the biopax level that you want whether by biopax level 2 or 3 then you use our biopax parser function called read biopax to read the the uh, biopax file and uh, parse it and then you choose which uh, pathway uh, you want from the file that you downloaded and you transform this to a molly uh, object and then you create an empty view you apply some modifications undo then reapply other modifications etc and at the end you can plot the graph and this is also a, a, a demo on how this uh, uh, workflow works. So if you uh, download the code that I gave you before for signaling by wind, this is what you uh, get. The uh, upper left side is the original graph after applying pathway to Molly, which transforms uh, the uh, Biopax encoded pathway into uh, a Molly object. After integrating drug data, this is what you get. So you have an extra layer. This is the violet layer that has the information coming from drug bank. And you can also see that you have connections between drugs and proteins. You can also apply different modifications. Here I deleted DNA, RNA, and complex layers. And you can see uh, different uh, versions of the same pathway. Of course, more information on this package can also be found uh, under the uh, under the in the paper that I listed here at the bottom of the screen. Finally, to uh, just put this to uh, practice and uh, understand or uh, evaluate the potentials of uh, the packages that I implemented, I collaborated with Dr. Eduardo Martinez from the University Major of uh, in Santiago, Chile. And the goal of the collaboration was to find potential drug targets for host-directed leishmaniasis uh, treatments. So in this, um, in this project, we worked on a disease called cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis, and uh, we used multipath and molly R packages to identify drug pathway relationships, model in uh, multi-layer graphs, map relevant knowledge, and finally filter potential drugs and drug targets. Just a little uh, background on the disease itself. It's called leishmaniasis and it's a tropical parasitic disease. 
it's caused by an infection with the Leishmania parasites and it has many infestation, manifestations, uh, so cutaneous and visceral. We focused on the cutaneous Leishmaniasis, which is transmitted by uh, bites of sand flies and it's caused by different Leishmania species. One of them is called Leishmania major or L major parasite. And it's uh, uh, normally manifested uh, with self-healing skin ulceration with induced uh, borders. The disease is neglected, but it has a high incidence of uh, between 700,000 and 1.2 million uh, infected per year and a low fatality rate. The work was uh, divided into two uh, workflows. First, I will be presenting the workflow of uh, uh, Eduardo Martinez. He started with a public set of uh, RNA-seq data that contained information on uh, four different uh, at four different time points of uh, L major infected human macrophage. He then performed a quality control using uh, fast QC to check the quality, uh, thermomatic to remove the low quality reads. After that, he counted the reads and calculated the gene expression values using HTC count. Uh, following that, uh, he normalized using DESeq2 and identified differentially expressed genes with a p-value less than 0.5 and a log fold uh, changed of, uh, change of more uh, than uh, 0.5. After that, he used the Dorothea Reference Gene Regulatory Network to filter the, the interaction targets, uh, uh, transcription factor that are a normalized uh, with a normalized read uh, minimum of 10, and he performed a pairwise uh, comparison between infected and healthy, uh, and he only considered the nodes that are in the infected network. At the end, he performed a gene ontology enrichment analysis uh, to filter the genes that are related to immune response, response to stress, and host pathogen interaction. So he was able to uh, give me a list of genes that I used in my workflow. In my workflow, I started with 113 genes. So I had HGNC uh, gene symbols that I mapped to 909 Uniprot uh, IDs, so 909 entries in Uniprot KB. Uh, these entries were uh, in, uh, involved in uh, 313 reactum IDs, so I uh, downloaded uh, these pathways in Biopax level 3. I parsed them and I created the molly graphs and I obtained 313 mollies. After that, I uh, removed the non-protein layers just to condense the information that I need. I filtered the protein uh, nodes in each molly, and then I uh, extracted uh, the drug protein connections and I added the drug layers to each molly that I had. And at the end, I was able to export the data of 21 genes that I gave back to uh, Dr. Martinez to uh, continue the analysis that we were doing. At the beginning, we had 195 uh, approved drugs, so 313 molly multilayered graphs for 113 potential targets, 124 biological pathways, and 331 different drugs interaction. After performing the network analysis that identified 113 key proteins and uh, the multilayer network analysis that revealed 145 targeting eight proteins, we had 145 drugs identified for leishmaniasis repurposing. Then we performed pathway analysis that showed participation in detoxification of reactive oxygen species, regulation of the apoptosome uh, activity or SCFC kit signaling pathway, and uh, the, uh, we had five potential therapeutic targets. Then uh, this was shortlisted based on evidence, so actual usage, side effects, pharmacological action, costs, etc. And it was shortlisted to 11 selected drugs. And at the end, after uh, validating using experimental validation through in vitro and in vivo assays, we were able to prove uh, three of these 11 drugs. At the end, uh, this is the list of uh, results that we obtained before the last stage. Uh, on the first uh, column, you can see the five uh, drug targets, the five genes that we had. Uh, in the second column, you have the 11 drugs that target these uh, genes, and you have uh, the different information on the drugs that we uh, uh, extracted from drug bank. And um, 
Most interestingly is that some of these drugs were previously used to treat similar conditions such as uh, acne, for example, you can see it here. This concludes my presentation. I would like to thank you all for your attention. Of course, I would uh, like to thank everyone in my lab uh, and miss it. Uh, most importantly, my professor and my mentor, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Frank Kama. I would like to also uh, thank my collaborator, Dr. Eduardo Martinez, uh, without whom I wouldn't uh, have been able to reach such uh, fruitful outcomes. I'd also like to thank uh, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and the Consortium EMED uh, Systems Medicine for the funding. And I am open for questions. Thank you. Okay, so that was a fantastic presentation. Um, please remember to put your questions in the chat bar. Uh, we will get to them in the order in which they are received. Now, I apologize in advance um, if I mispronounce anyone's name. Sorry, we're back. Okay, so we have a question here from uh, Sumaya Yasmin, uh, who says, thank you for the wonderful talk. Can we use MOLLE to create multi-morbidity graphs for diseases, uh, or is it mainly used to support pathway-based analysis? Yeah, so this is what I mentioned in the presentation. I wanted to uh, address as much uh, uh, audience as possible. And uh, the idea was that I implement the model itself in a separate package and not mix it together with the biomedicine or biomedical usage of it. So MOLLE is actually, uh, it would be possible to use money for any purpose. I get a lot of uh, emails that people are using it for, for, for example, geographical uh, modeling for, it's not always like biological data or biomedical data. The full control over the creation of the uh, layers is uh, in the hand of the user. So when you create an empty uh, money uh, graph, you get to choose how much layer you want, what the names of the layers are, etc. And this is how you, you start adding the nodes to each layer. So it would be possible, yeah. Okay, that was a very clear answer. Uh, so as we wait for some other audience questions to roll in, um, I actually, I had a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so primarily, I, I think the focus when you were discussing the um, sort of multi-layer graphs was around um, their definition and, and the visualization. But I was curious if there's advantages in terms of analysis that you can get over sort of like a single layer graph with multiple kinds of nodes and edges. Uh, yeah, so I also mentioned that it extends a package called iGraph. And iGraph is also widely used in the community of bioinformatics. And the thing is that iGraph supports as many possible analyses as possible. So you get to have the advantages of a monolayer graph because it's actually an iGraph object. And you get to also have this multi-layer visualization and mathematical modeling using money. Perfect. <laughs> uh, OK, we have a question here from Anke Chan. He says, can you share the process of deciding which layers to streamline or move during the filtering step? Uh, and this is specifically in regards to what you shared in the collaboration with yeah. Chile. Uh, so uh, the decision was based on uh, the information that Drug Bank has. And Drug Bank has information on drug targets. It has uh, four different uh, drug uh, targets types. So it has carriers, transporters, drug targets, and I forgot the first one. And uh, the thing is that uh, all of these have HGNC symbols. And uh, when you have a pathway, uh, most pathway, like all pathways that you download from Reactum have protein layers, but not all of them have gene layers. So my decision was based on the fact that I wanted to have this connection between drugs and genes. So I bridged the connection to proteins, and this is why I filtered, uh, filtered the small molecule layers, the RNA layers, the uh, complex layers, because, because I didn't need this. And it's going to just make my analysis more complex because it's a lot of data that is not used. I only filtered the protein layer. If you had a gene layer in your, uh, in your MOLLE model, then it would be also very good. You still have the connection between drugs and uh, genes. 
I hope I answered the question. <laughs> And uh, I think the code for uh, the Chile project was not published in the paper, but if you write me an email, I can also guideline you for how to write a similar code. Okay, there we go. That's fantastic. Um, so there's a follow-up question from Sumera also about the Chile uh, project research or um, workflow. And they say, I have another question about drugs. Uh, how were drugs shortlisted or selected in the initial set, not the final one? Yeah, so um, my uh, my task was to get, to get the drugs, first of all, that have connections to these pathways. I then filtered the drugs that were uh, all of the drugs. And that, that some of them were investigational, some of them were not approved and vet approved. We only, uh, we only considered the approved, vet approved, and uh, I think a third one. And then... Uh, based on literature research so my uh, collaborator dr martinez he uh, did a very thorough literature research just to see if there's anything that uh, was mentioned before on these drugs for uh, leishmaniasis usage and then uh, the tested in uh, in brazil for the evidence so my the computational part was only based on the type of the drug and then there's the literature research, and then there's the validation, the experimental validation. Right. Okay. So it was uh, it was a lot of factors that went into the decision. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so again, just in the meantime, I have another quick question. So uh, you've been working with drug bank data for a while now, and I was just curious if you could share some of your experiences about working with it and specifically when it comes to um, combining it with these other data sources like Reactome, um, was that challenging? Did you have to do a lot of work to make that happen or was it relatively straightforward? Yeah, so the most work I did was to understand the structure of drug bank actually and then i was able to understand it i also built some kind of uh, graph to uh, represent this how the connections are what you have drug bank cards what each entry has for information i also published this in my dissertation uh, this is the first step. The second step was to compare drug bank to other databases. And I uh, considered also many databases. I don't want to mention any of them, but uh, I uh, found that uh, drug bank has the most information and is uh, the best for uh, like considering the user friendliness and uh, access because you get to access drug bank really easily because you get only to register with your email and then you get the full database as an XML file. And I also found uh, many R packages that do the parsing. Uh, the best of them was the one that I use. It's called DB Parser. It was a very nice uh, package. You only get to read the file, and then you get the data frame with every information that you need. So the, it was the best for, the, for my purpose, the easiest to use, and uh, with the most information. OK, excellent. And that's a great recommendation, too, for anybody who wants to do work with drug bank data and our DB parser uh, yeah, comes recommended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I had one more question, actually, and this one's um, perhaps a little bit more philosophical. I think earlier in the presentation, you discussed how a lot of the data sources that are out there are more sort of structured based on what the data is and how it's collected rather than what it means. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the idea of semantic meaning and how graphs can help us to capture and, and make use of that information. Yeah. So uh, if you consider any type of graph, not just uh, multi-layered graphs, the thing is that you get to create one node per entity. So if you are uh, having information on proteins, Protein information can come from drug bank, can come from a gene database, from CAC, for example, can come from a pathway database, from Reactum, for example, can also come from OMM, so disease database. It can come from many sources. And the thing is, like, we look at the smallest details, for example, which ID they use. Let's look at the gene, for example. You can have the ensemble ID, you can have the HGNC symbol, and each database doesn't consider that reducing this interoperability problem uh, is by just agreeing on using just one type of ID, for example, for uh, the, this entry. Uh, the drug bank has HGNC, which is the best because it's, it's widely used, the HGNC symbol. 
So the first thing I would say is the semantic problem with the naming, with the ideas that they used, and how to get the information. So uh, you have this as a cross-reference at the end as the targets. So you can also have this in Uniprot and Reactum. It's very uh, easy. But if you go to Keg, it's going to be much more complex. If you go to Omem, you don't have this. You have to parse the whole file just to get this small part of the text that contains the, the name of the gene or the symbol of the gene. Yes, I think anyone who's worked even a little bit with um, or in bioinformatics, I should say, has encountered the issue of interoperability and everyone wanting to have their own identifier. Yeah, it's underrated, I would say. It's really underrated. The work with it is really, it's awful. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and then another quick question, uh, which I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on sort of the difference between node and edge colored graphs and yeah. which which applications might be better served choosing one or the other. And I guess specifically when we're talking about biology. Yeah. So um, node colored graphs and edge colored graph, the difference is how you group the, uh, the how you create the layers. The layers can be created based on the types of the nodes or on the types of the color uh, of uh, the edges. So th these are the colors. And I would recommend using node colored graphs when you are grouping the population that you have. So for example, if you have a population and you are trying to uh, have nodes for the gender, for example, you have male, female, diverse, etc. This, you use node colored graphs. But if you also uh, are also looking at population, you want to look, for example, for as I said, in epidemiology, if you are looking for the status of a certain uh, person, the, the health status of a certain person, you get to have, for example, this SIR model. You have three layers, one for susceptible, one for infected, one for recovered. Uh, you can look for different kind of relationships between people. So uh, their neighborhood like uh, relations or maybe they work together or maybe their family. So you get to have different kinds of connections for the same graph, for the same population. And this would uh, actually have a great effect on the decision that you make. For example, if you are studying the spreadness of certain disease, if you look only at the like family connection level and you don't look at the uh, uh, neighborhood, for example, you wouldn't find anything because two, two people got infected because they're neighbors, but not because they're family. Yeah. So, uh, Another another uh, aspect that I also looked into was mixing both of them together. So if you want to also subset the set of nodes that you have and have different colors for the edges, that would also be possible if you combine, for example, SIR models together with this uh, gender, for example. You, you get to have uh, different layers for the gender and different layers for the kind of relations that you have. I also have a thorough research uh, on this uh, in the paper. If you go to the paper, I summarized uh, the papers that used uh, different kinds and different implementations of multilayered graphs. So if you read the paper, you would find a lot of uh, examples on it. Mm -hmm. yes. It's only a biomedicine use, so. <laughs> Yes, and I can say I have read that paper, and I would highly recommend it to anybody oh. in the audience who wants to, to learn more about this topic. Uh, OK, good. We have some more audience questions. So Marisol Garcia says, awesome presentation. I have two questions. Can this approach be used for any type of condition or disease? And how does it compare to other systems biology approaches? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, for the compliment. And uh, it can be used for any type of condition and disease. As I said, it's um, it's very flexible. But if you mean multipath, multipath only works uh, with path. So the main uh, base of uh, of the creation of the model in multipath is the pathway that comes from Reactum. So you start by building the pathway, and then you add the information from drug bank, etc. cetera. Uh, then you can, what you can do, and what I also did, um, it was a small project. You get to map the uh, the values or the like genetic uh, gene expression values that you have from patients. You can map it on uh, the model, and then you get to infer uh, other knowledge. How does it compare to other systems biology approaches? As far as I know, uh, no one used uh, multi-layer uh, uh, multi graphs for modeling before. 
for modeling pathways. And uh, I didn't also find any other uh, package or any other, other tool in other languages, not only in R, that combines as, uh, this much information. So it comes from uh, the Reactum, from Drug Bank, and from Uniprot. Uh, it's also being now extended with uh, three more databases from KEG, uh, OMIM, and uh, KBI. So this, I think this is the advantage. Okay, that's excellent too. Another a thing to look forward to in the future. Um, yeah. Watch for, watch for another publication. I'm sure when we'll be coming. It's called Multipath uh, 2.0. There we go, Multipath 2.0. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have another question from Anka who says, "How long did it take you to build the Molly graphs and then to get through each step before finding the drug candidates?" Uh, you mean for uh, the use case, right? For uh, the uh, I would believe so, yes. Let's go with the use case. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the hardest step was, first of all, to find the pathways that I wanted, uh, the, the mapping first. But then uh, downloading the pathway, I have, a, um, I have a function that downloads the pathways uh, directly from Reactum. You don't have to do it manually. And then you uh, just loop over the, the files that you have and you create the molly graphs. It depends on the size of the file that you have, but it's uh, it's very fast. So it's it also gives you, and as verbose, uh, like in the console, uh, how long it takes. I, I would say five seconds per file. And uh, then you uh, you get just to filter and everything. It's going to be much, uh, like, really fast. Unless you have a huge file, like, 500 megabytes or something that would take time and then uh, get through each step before finding the drug candidates uh, the drug candidates were not the problem because I also have the functions to get the connections you only got uh, you only give the list of proteins that you have and then it, it gets you the, the connections from drug bank and it adds it as a layer and that's it so everything okay. is automated there's nothing hard coded <laughs> yeah one of those you can hit enter and then walk away and get some coffee. So. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that actually uh, brings up a, a very interesting question, I think, which is, um, is there any sort of like size constraint? Uh, is there a point at which this approach will, will start to encounter issues if you have say yeah. a million nodes and connections between all of them? Well, this depends on the uh, sir, uh, on the computer that you're using, but I had one problem that I also mentioned in the paper. Uh, the package that I was using to fetch information from Uniprod KB is called Uniprod WS. I'm trying to change that. What they do is they give you a limit of like 50 proteins or 100 proteins, and after that you get like five uh, seconds and then like five tries and then it, it doesn't give you anything back so i would recommend adding them like by batches so if you add like 50 and then do the second 50s and then this would be much faster this is the only issue that i uh, faced uh, otherwise be, because i also used big uh, big pathways otherwise i didn't uh, i didn't face any other problems okay that's really good to know <laughs> yeah uh, okay, I think maybe one or two more questions and then we'll wrap up. So uh, one other question for me is uh, I've noticed like over the last couple of years that taking a graph-based approach in biology and, and network medicine um, seems to be gaining traction. Uh, there's you know an increase in popularity and, and more people working to try to understand the properties of these graphs. So I'm just curious if you could in your own personal experience, what do you think is driving this increased interest? Well, graphs, because they're easy to uh, to visualize, they're easy to understand, and also the the wide, um, the, the great number of tools that you have to analyze this, because the graph format itself is easily process, uh, processable for us as humans and for computers. So, and then you have a lot of uh, analysis tools that you can use, you, you have many possibilities, and. And you don't have to be an expert in graph theory to work with it. It's the magic of software. If you know exactly. how to call functions, you can do the work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, excellent. So if there's no other questions from the audience, I think we can, oh, maybe one last question here. Uh, oh. 
Okay, perfect. So I think at this point we can wrap up. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for part two in our uh, Powered by George Bank academic webinar series. Uh, if you're interested in participating in a future series, um, please feel free to submit your paper or research to uh, Drug Bank, either through our normal contact form or by directly reaching out to Kathleen at drugbank.com. And of course, you can find us on social uh, for all updates and future talks. Um, we'll also be uh, presenting this episode on demand later, so you can go back and watch again in case you missed something. Uh, you can find Dr. Hamoud on LinkedIn. I'm sure that she would welcome uh, questions or feedback even after this presentation. Excellent. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Hamoud so much for taking the time to sit down and chat with us. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending and we hope to see you all again at a future presentation. All right. Thank you again Bye for the invitation. Yeah, fantastic. Bye. All right. Bye, all.